You're listening to the Play Therapy Podcast with Dr. Brenna Hicks, your source for centered and focused play therapy coaching. Hi, I'm Dr. Brenna Hicks, the Kid Counselor. This is the Play Therapy Podcast, where you get a master class in child-centered play therapy and practical support and application for your work with children and their families. I know last week I mentioned we were moving into a new section of the curriculum, and that's true, (laughs) but I'm pausing the curriculum. I'm doing a two-part pause, okay? So thanks for bearing with my whims. Here's why I'm on a whim, though. It really is important, and it's purposeful, even though it seems random. We are currently talking about choice giving in the CCPT Collective, the online community for Child Center Play Therapists. So April is choice giving month. So we've been processing that quite a bit. And then in the Play Therapy Professional Program, we have been talking about limit setting this week. And one of the things that I've noticed is that the limit setting process is really tripping up a lot of therapists. And it's tripping them up in a lot of different ways, and it's not always consistently difficult, but there are some components that I want to spend two weeks diving into and really equipping you all with a deeper limit setting dive because I don't want us to just know how to set limits. In other words, we reflect the feeling, we provide the neutral limit, and we give alternatives. I want to take it beyond that because I don't think that we are effectively and easily setting limits right now based on the videos that I've been watching and the conversations that I've been having with clinicians in the collective and in the certification program. And when I notice that it's a struggle, I feel like it's my job to try to help with that. So we're going to take a two-week pause on the curriculum to address this deeper dive on limit setting, and then we'll be back to regular new content, I promise. But here's what's going on, in my opinion. I don't know that it's necessarily universally true, but this is what I'm seeing anyway. Limit setting is quite difficult, and I think the reason why is because it requires three skills. You have to be able to reflect the feeling, You have to be able to neutrally communicate a limit, and then you have to be able to provide choices. So you're essentially fusing three skills into one process, and if any one of those three skills is not as well honed as one of the others, you might feel like that creates a hiccup for you. So I think that's one consideration. The second consideration is limits are often not necessary in sessions. So there are some kids with whom you will probably never need to set a limit. There are some kids that you would rarely need to set a limit. And then we do get the here and there kids that require a lot of limits. But compared to the other skills, for example, we can reflect feelings with every child that walks through the room. We can encourage every child that walks through the room. We can provide choices to every child that walks through the room. The other three will be much more commonly used, and therefore we will be more proficient at those just for repetition and consistency's sake. Limit setting is the least used of the pillars, so therefore I think we need to practice it more because we don't get every session, every day opportunities to do it. And then finally, my thought is limit setting, the process is fast. In other words, on the fly, in the moment, you have to be able to quickly get out the acknowledgement of the feeling, the neutral limit, provide the choices all in one fell swoop in a daisy chain together. And before the child actually does the thing that you're setting the limit on, so often there's a sense of urgency, right? The child is darting for the door and you have a very short amount of time to try to get that limit set before they open the handle and run out into the hallway. So sometimes the urgency and the immediate need to be able to say that quickly creates the, oh my gosh, how am I supposed to get this out? I'm saying the wrong thing. No, that didn't work. Oh, I forgot to reflect the feeling, et cetera, et cetera. So when we see the complexity of this, I think it's first of all understandable why this is something that is a little bit trickier to deal with. But also, I think that's the evidence of why it's not being done effectively. So when we're role-playing and when we're watching videos, 
I'm seeing a lot of therapists really struggle with the limit setting process. And that can be any of those three components, right? Sometimes it's struggle with reflection of feelings. Sometimes it's struggle with setting of the neutral limit. Sometimes it's struggling with giving the choices. So we're going to kind of look through that a little bit in these next, in this episode and in the next one. So next week, we're going to actually talk through how you make sure that you are doing those three steps effectively. But today, I want to give you some encouragement about what you might do to really start working on this skill. We talked about this in the CCPT Collective, and then I think we also might have talked about it on a couple of my coaching calls too in the last few weeks. The Chinese proverb says you need 10,000 hours to master whatever that is. To be considered a master of something, you need 10,000 hours of practice. So if any of you are over that 10,000 hour mark, good for you. You're probably a veteran and you probably will just hear this as a reinforcement of what you're already doing. But if you haven't hit 10,000 hours of play sessions yet, that's not 10,000 hours of training. That's not 10,000 hours of knowledge or education. That's 10,000 hours in a playroom with a child doing child-centered play therapy. If you're not there yet, then you still have more work to do. And that's an encouragement, not a criticism, right? So I'm not saying, you know, look, you're not good enough yet. That's not what I mean. I'm saying that means that you still have a lot more practice and you will get there. So here's what I think is the easiest way to really kind of start to address this. Work on empowerment choices first. And why am I talking about the choice giving part? Because that's usually the biggest struggle. And we'll actually talk through the reflecting feeling part of it next time. So just hold on. We'll get there if that's one of your struggles. But I think that where there's often difficulty is in the choice giving piece. Because we either give a choice that doesn't work. We give a choice that doesn't make sense. We start the choice and then we realize, oh, no, I shouldn't have said that. That that can't be an option. Then we have to try to finagle our way out of it. There's a lot of difficulty with the choice giving piece of limit setting. So practice when you're not setting a limit. And the way that you do that is empowerment choices. Your goal should be to give kids in the playroom as many empowerment choices as you can so that you're getting the wording so that there is an ease, there is a flow, there's a comfort of the skill. You can choose A or you can choose B. Which do you choose? That gives you the repetition of giving choices when it's not tied to a limit. Because the pressure is far less in an empowerment choice. You're giving it just for the sake of allowing the child to have a choice. There's no urgency, there's no behavior issue, there's no, oh my gosh, I have to try to make sure that this limit gets set before something bad happens. That's when it really gets sticky in the room, right? So if we can empower choice give, that allows the child to feel empowered, which we have very positive outcomes in that scenario, but also you get practice and rehearsal just providing choices, The more comfortable you are with the choice giving piece, the easier limit setting will come. So therefore, as you have worked out all of your kinks and your tweaks and all of that, you just continue to use empowerment choices in the playroom as much as possible. When that is second nature, then you start to transition that skill to the enforcement choices, which will always tie into limit setting. Because let's face it, when we set a limit, If the choices that we provide are not ideal, the whole limit setting process is undermined. And what I mean by ideal is there's a lot of considerations. Are they enforceable? Can they be consistent? Do they make sense for what's going on? Do they meet the child's original need or desire? Are you accepting of those choices? Is the child accepting of those choices? There's a lot of factors involved. And if you're going oh my word, I've never thought that all of those factors should be considered in choice giving. That's probably why it's hard for you. Therefore, as we are practicing 
It's just about the repetition of feeling comfortable with the words first. Then we can start adding in all of these more extensive, advanced considerations. And the last thing that we want to do is just try to wing a choice. When that happens, everything falls apart. And the more we can be intentional and thoughtful and purposeful with our choices, the more effectively we will set limits when we need to. But there's a lot of precursory work that has to happen first. So here's what I would encourage you to do this week. Because next week, obviously, I'll do part two of this and we'll talk more about limit setting. So you can kind of wait until you've heard that episode to really practice some other things. But this week specifically, I challenge you to focus on empowerment choices with your own children, if they're still in the house, with clients at your office or your center or wherever you work as many opportunities as you can to work on giving choices. You can choose A or you can choose B, which do you choose? And yes, you have to say choose three times. It's not you can do this, you can do this, you can have this, you can have that, you can pick this, you can pick that. That's not a choice. A choice is very clearly a choice when the word choose is included. So you can choose A or you can choose B and then you follow it up with which do you choose? If you say that as many times as humanly possible this week, you will have rehearsed that to where that will become second nature and you at least will have the wording of the choices down. Then we start thinking through what the actual choices need to be when it's tied into a limit. So I hope that you find that helpful. I hope that that gives you a little goal for the week and it will only serve you as you really start to hone the limit setting because reflecting feeling is a precursor and choice giving is a precursor and then they come together to form the limit setting. And if any of those are not where they should be, it makes limit setting very, very challenging. Alrighty, so part two coming next. But if you would like to connect with me, I would love to hear from you, Brenna at thekidcounselor.com. You can email me questions, a hello, a challenge, whatever you'd like to say. I would love to hear from you. I love when y'all reach out to me. If you would like to subscribe to my email newsletter, I would love to have you on board with that. We send out an email once a week, so you will not be bombarded in your inbox, I promise. But I always just make you aware of what's happening and how you can connect with me in that newsletter. So that's at playtherapynow.com. And you'll find out about training opportunities there, about the CCPT Collective, about the Play Therapy Professional Certification, et cetera, et cetera. So all the stuff that's going on around here. Be in the know. You don't want to be in the dark because you know how much I care about you. So you have to stay connected so that you keep in touch with me. You can also call in a question if you would like, 813-812-5525. That's in the States. If you'd like to leave a message for me, I will be able to answer your question from that number as well. All right, y'all. I hope you all had a wonderful weekend. I, I actually had a really, really awesome weekend. I was able to synchronize swim at Mar a Lago, which is President Trump's club and home in Florida. So last minute invitation to go swim there and they were doing an event and I was able to swim with four other women and we did synchronized swimming at the Mar-a-Lago pool. So really cool experience. And that was my excitement for the weekend. So I hope that something was exciting for you this weekend too, or at least that there was something that made you smile because I think sometimes we need to be reminded of how amazing this world is. And, you know, being a children's therapist can be draining, it can be defeating, it can be overwhelming. And that's why you're here, right? For support and encouragement and uplift and refresh and all of those things. But sometimes it's nice to have something that makes us smile. So I hope that you were able to smile this weekend. If not, smile right now. It releases all kinds of feel-good hormones and endorphins and things. And so even if you're not happy, it will make you happy. That's the beauty of a smile. So there's your PSA for the day. (laughs) All right. Love y'all. We'll talk again soon. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Play Therapy Podcast with Dr. Brenna Hicks. For more episodes and resources, please go to www.playtherapypodcast.com.